Vasquez, and I'm with Octane. Uh, Octane's a big supporter of the Entrepreneurs Forum here at uh, Cal Act 2 and, and also a big supporter of the Tech Portal. Uh, and I uh, want to welcome you to today's event. I'd like to introduce Frank Cooper, who's uh, over here on your left, and Patrick Laskovitz, who's here on, uh, on your right. They're going to be talking about, uh, uh, about uh, their vision right now of the kind of the, the end of classic uh, startup marketing as we know it and the beginning of a, of a brand new age, hopefully. And um, uh, I just wanted to uh, give one quick, uh, quick pitch here for Octane that uh, tonight is our uh, regular free first Thursday networking event. Uh, we call it Firsty, and uh, it's pretty popular. We get about 150 people that attend each month. And uh, this year, we're moving Firsty around every month, and we're doing it at the old Dubliner, which is in the Tustin Marketplace, uh, the new Tustin Marketplace that they've opened up over there. And we're doing it in conjunction with the Harvard uh, Business School Alumni Association of Orange County. So a lot of the, uh, the members of that association will be there tonight. Starts at 5.30, goes till about 7.30, and uh, you are all very welcome to attend. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Brandon and Patrick. Thank, Thank you guys very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, anybody here heard of uh, Lean Startups or Customer Development? How about the buzzword pivot? Anybody been reading about the word pivot? I actually throw that one out there because almost everybody has been aware of the buzzword pivot. But in this group, that's not, that's great though. I love to talk about talk to people that haven't heard of this stuff before. So Patrick and I are, are super pass passionate about lean startups and customer development. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk to you a little bit about why we're passionate about it, what are lean startups, and then how that might affect the way you do uh, market assessments. Do you have anything sure. yet? And real quick, are, is there, who here is actively doing a startup? Anyone? One person here? Three, four, maybe five? Got it. The, the rest of you, maybe you can tell me a little bit about some of your backgrounds or what you guys are working on. Uh, I'm the sales and marketing director for a small company. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Is that? I'm uh, uh, working with him as an independent sales rep, always looking for ways to tune up the okay. wine process. Okay. Got it. Anyone back there, sir? I'm going to pick on you. I'm Haas Patel. I'm an independent consultant and also peak at UCI Extension. Great. And the gentleman behind you? Uh, Chris Perra. I'm a product developer. Beautiful. Okay, I love it. Product development guys, too. Okay, good. So, there, um, should we just jump right into it? Yeah. So, uh, the startup ecosystem, the startup environment is changing drastically, right? So, uh, the amount of of money it takes to develop a product now is extremely low. Um, uh, so you have social media marketing that means that uh, reaching a broader audience costs a lot less money. So primarily if you're working in software, internet, wireless, uh, hardware solutions for the IT as well. There's some, some markets, obviously clean tech and some uh, life sciences where it's still expensive to uh, build products, but even with those, the, the price of building a startup company is drastically lower than it was uh, even five, ten years ago. Um, there's a ton of money out there for investment, um, and it's not just in the in the venture capitalists anymore. You have incubators, accelerators uh, that are willing to start uh, with very sp small uh, investments to get people going. There's uh, a lot of angels now in the micro VCs. You've maybe heard about super angels. Uh, and so there's uh, money flowing to startups uh, really uh, like never before. Um, this is also a global phenomenon, so it's not just a U.S. that there's these entrepreneurs coming out of the, uh, the woodworks in order to build uh, new products. It's happening uh, in every country. Uh, Patrick and I uh, hopefully have an opportunity to travel to, uh, to Central South America this, uh, this summer, traveling to Canada. People that we see tweeting about lean startups and customer development are, are literally all over the world, so it's pretty exciting that way. Uh, entrepreneurship is very social now, so it's not only in terms of your marketing, but it's also, uh, it's also going to meetups. It's also the resources that are online. Um, so the amount of mentoring that goes on, the collaboration between entrepreneurs is like it never was before. I used to go to networking meetings you know, 20 years ago, and, and then it was really sort of all about me. I wanted to tell you about me and give you my business card. And today, a lot of these meetups are completely flipped. It's like, tell me about you. How can I give you value? 
And it's really, an, it's, a, it's a great collaborative environment. And what it means is that today's entrepreneurs have a lot of peer support as well as a lot of mentoring. Uh, even even uh, classes like this, right? So uh, what that makes is today's entrepreneurs a lot more savvy than entrepreneurs have been in the past. So they're not, they're not more intelligent, but they're actually coming to the game with a lot more knowledge, with a lot more help, a lot more uh, understanding uh, the, the ups and downs, the roller coaster ride of being an entrepreneur. Uh, so it really is sort of this new, new environment. And what, what we're seeing is, is that there's now hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs. It just, it, it amazes me how many people are coming up with ideas and actually able to go launch their product because, because it doesn't cost that much. People graduate from college, people are actually in college assuming that they're gonna be an entrepreneur that they're not gonna go work for a business for 10, 20 years and then become an entrepreneur straight out of college. So Patrick and I just both participate in, in these uh, uh, lean machine, <coughs> lean startup machine weekends. Has anybody heard of a startup weekend? So a startup weekend is when you get usually a bunch of engineers uh, together in a room for a weekend. Voluntarily, this is what they're do, doing on their weekends and they build products over the weekend. And so the traditional method is you sit around and you build products that that nobody cares about, right? Well, the lean startup approach to that is you actually take that same team of engineers and they, and they get out of the building. Uh, and uh, they do that in order to learn whether the products that they're gonna build over the weekend, it, whether anybody might want them. What, why I bring this up now, though, is that what's amazing to me is to see the number of quality ideas that are pitched at these startup weekends. You get 50, 60 people in a room, half of them stand up and pitch their ideas, and you know they're not all rock star ideas. They're not all great ideas, uh, but this is being repeated over and over again all over the world. So to me, it's just this phenomena of of entrepreneurs. So because the costs have changed, because there's all of this money, the power in the relationship with investors uh, versus founders is now shifting to the founder side. So uh, it's no longer that you're going to have to. Uh, a stand in line to go uh, meet a VC on, on the VC's uh, grounds, you get to uh, start building your product and prove your business model with, with low amounts of money, perhaps seed funding, and then the, the, the venture capitalists are gonna come to you. Um, my personal belief is that this is driving, VCs are gonna need to change their model so that they're no longer just uh, going for the big win, which is kind of their traditional strategy. They're gonna invest in a bunch of companies hoping one of them is gonna be you know, a hundred million dollar company and, and then they get the returns they want. So a lot of the VCs that we're seeing, the micro VCs are, are really looking for uh, the smaller wins too, which it means the mergers and acquisitions that get f founders a life-changing experience. They sell their company for 15, 20, 50 million dollars. Uh, that's a life-changing uh, occurrence. So again, in my belief, if, if, the, if these startups are building their businesses in, in the new way, in this new, new startup methodology, then there's this potential for our economy to develop a, what I call an innovation machine. And so it, it's my belief that we're shifting away from services. Services are being outsourced now, so what is our comparative advantage gonna be as an economy? And it is going to be our entrepreneurship. It is going to be entrepreneurs that are increasing productivity of individuals and businesses through the new products that they build. And so what we're having now with the hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs, each targeting a, uh, a market, uh, carving out a niche and building products that are suited for that niche, um, I really believe we're, get, we're creating this innovation machine. And I think that the methodology to do it is through lean startups, and real, we're gonna say why. Real quickly, what we also want, I just wanna make clear that, that how we're, how we're positioned is, this is radically different than what happened in the Silicon Valley, the dot-com boom 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, right? Where it was all about the $100 million exit, cost you $5 million in six months and 10 guys to build what would now take you one guy and you know some out-of-the-box uh, out software, essentially. So we're, it's a radically, in 10 years, we've, I think we've, we've had just you know, orders of magnitude change in terms of how to build scalable startups in terms of the knowledge needed, the knowledge transfer, low, you know, cost is, has, has, you know, again, orders of magnitude difference. So, so there's, a, yeah, so there's, there's three pop popular philosophies that get a lot of play on Twitter and the blogosphere, and this is the way I summarize them. One, the first one is be like Steve. So instead of, uh, you know, 
the Be Like Mike, you know, they used to say the, the ad campaign for uh, Michael Jordan, and, and to me the, the analogy was is a high school counselor actually goes and talks to these uh, young uh, uh, student athletes and says, yeah, you know, really what you should do for your career is, is go be like Michael Jordan, right? So now we have investors out there and they're, they're holding on to their dream of the $100 million win or whatever, and they're saying, oh, all you gotta do is go be like Steve Jobs, okay? So that's, that's strategy number one, be like Steve. Strategy number two is almost the opposite. It's the just do it faction, right? And so the just do it faction, the, my sports analogy for that is, is uh, everybody could be an Olympic athlete um, if you just try hard enough, right? So it's all about execution. So in the startup world, what that means is all of you can be uh, you know, billionaires, and if you're not, it's just, it's just because you're not working hard enough, okay? The third philosophy out there is the, is, what, is the lean startup methodology. And so what is it about lean startups? Why lean startups? So here's the two big ideas around, around lean startups. The first is that a vast majority of startups fail not because they can't build a product, it's because they have no market. So, so if you think about that for a second, the technology is, is advanced enough now that most companies, most products that you want to build are pretty darn easy to build. You can build internet products, you can build software, you can build wireless iPhone apps. There's not technology risk. Where there is risk is, is in the market. Do people care about what you're building? So again, this is actually deceptively simple. So we, we often say this, or I also, I'll often reference this. And then people go, their eyes sort of glaze over, and they go, oh yeah, of course. But it's actually, it's not of course. If this is true, then we wouldn't have the dot-com boom again 10, you know, 10, 11 years ago, okay? So the, what, what, and the, 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 the person that advanced this idea is a guy named Steve Blank. He wrote a book called The Four Steps of the Epiphany. If you're doing any sort of product development or startups, you should go out and read that book today. It's called The Four Steps of the Epiphany by Steve Blank. And this is a big idea. Again, deceptively simple, uh, massive idea, and really has huge, now, a sort of, sort of um, seismic effects, ripple effects in the startup world. Um, also, a guy named Clayton, oh, there we go, Clayton Christensen. Right. Very similar. So, so the second idea you want to keep in mind is that your business model, you're building a startup, it's very likely that some major aspect, probably more than one, aspect of your business model is going to change at some point. So most of the products that we know and love didn't start out the way we know them, right? So uh, does anybody know how YouTube started with their, they, they started out as a dating site. Uh, PayPal started out as microprocessors on the Palm Pilot. Uh, you have any Favorite, yeah, favorite Flickr, Flickr was, I think, uh, like a uh, Flickr originally was like a, a, a chat application in a, in a game. Um, who else? And there's, there's also, you can take stuff offline. For example, you know, YPRO, the Indian uh, IT services uh, firm, multi billion dollar firm, started out as a vegetable oil processing uh, uh, plant. Right now, they're multi billion dollars. The, the point is that, that due to market conditions, right, uh, companies and startups have to evolve. Um, and well, even when Christensen wrote this in the early 90s, he, he referenced uh, Intel, which started out in DRAM before they were in, into microprocessors. Uh, and uh, uh, Honda actually made their uh, foray into the United States by essentially inventing uh, off-road motorcycles when what they were trying to do was compete against um, BMW and Harley-Davidson for, for street bikes. And I, I think Facebook is the same story, right? They started out like a dating site in the harbor of guys. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, just really the the more the more you learn about these companies is they they <coughs> end up, and this is why do I have this slide coming up? It's the why why pivot is such a, a big buzzword out in in uh, in our world now is because. Uh, everybody's talking about, oh, you got to pivot, you got to pivot, you got to pivot, and of course you don't want to overdo this, but it really is now sort of this internet meme um, is all about is all about pivoting. There's also sort of a, a conspiracy, which is sort of a strong, word, a strong word, but there's a conspiracy when you see a successful startup that made it big, the, the marketing people, the PR folks, go back and rewrite history. They're like, oh, YouTube is huge and massive now, and this was what it was going to be from the very, very first day we started YouTube. 
right? Or and I'm not trying to pick on YouTube, it's, I think it's a great company, or any startup. You see it, once the success has been achieved, everyone goes back and rewrites history, it makes it look like it was, you know, preordained. And then, you know, and also then says that's the roadmap for the future, right? right? So you invent a story of the past and you project it forward and, and that's your roadmap. Right. right. So Grant, when you use the word pivot, are you saying that when you start a startup, you pivot on something, but then you expand into a much broader scope? Is that the context here or I'm not getting this? Okay, well, yeah, it's, I'm introducing it a little bit early. We, we talked about it a little bit more in a, in a couple slides. So when, when we get to that, um, follow up with your question if I don't, if I don't answer it, okay? So here's the, um, the basic tenets of, of the Lean Startup then, right? So you don't really know what the problem is or the solution. You have good guesses as, as to what they are. Your business model is going to change. So what you have to do is go through those changes fast enough until you find what works, and you have to do that before you run out of money. So that's what the concept of the Lean Startup is. So uh, real quick, actually, right? Real quick. So, the, what I like about this, this, these, these big ideas here, and I really think they are big ideas, is that this was always a fundamental truth in sort of the, the chaos of startup land, but the changes that people went through are always sort of driven by panic and fear. Like, oh, we tried to do um, you know, pet food, you know, online pet food delivery. Oh, it's really not working. What are we going to do next? Right? The, the pivot, or whatever you want to call the pivot or iteration, was going to happen at some point because you know, we have incomplete information about what the market wants and how we deliver that, et cetera, et cetera. It was gonna happen anyway. This is actually embracing, my mind embracing sort of the reality of, of, of how startups actually work. So, maybe an overly complicated slide, but this is, uh, real quickly, basically, uh, lean startups are about combining what's called agile development with, uh, with customer development. Agile development is an engineering term for uh, developing small amounts of code, small amounts of features in, in a very short time uh, and getting that out in front of the customers to validate that it works and that people want it combined with customer development, which is a similar principle to test your, your marketing. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an integrated approach since your, your people out speaking to customers can bring that back into the engineers. The engineers can build it so then you actually have product in front of customers and that's testing it and, and your, your, uh, your solution team then, or your problem team that's out there figuring out whether they've got the right idea nailed with their customers uh, takes that, that product out and, and they, so it's a continuous loop on both the market development side simultaneously with the product development side. And, you know, I keep wanting to juxtapose this sort of the uh, this, and I don't want to be a straw man, but you know, previous, right? People often built stuff six months in a cave, coding an app. No, not even six months, right. but two or three years. And right? then presenting to presenting right. it to a customer, like, oh, what do you think? And then wondering why they didn't get traction. Right. So, right. The, so, so the old style, uh, still being taught in a lot of places. Uh, you know, you write a forty-page business plan, put in your requisite hockey stick revenues, right? <laughs> Um, then you go and you present that to your, uh, your investors, and if you get somebody that will actually invest on you, you've essentially signed a contract that, yeah, you're going to deliver the, these revenue uh, targets that you pulled out of the air, right? So then you, you got your investment money based on the, this hockey stick, and uh, then you spend a year, two years building the product. Towards the end of that process, you start hiring your sales and marketing people. And you do this big launch, right? Big marketing launch, get the product out there. You maybe make a couple of opportunistic sales. You know, you sell to the, the brother-in-law of one of your board of directors. Um, and you have this little bit of success. And, you know, maybe you hit those uh, really super low first quarter targets. And then suddenly you start seeing in the second quarter, you know, it's flatlining. Uh, in today's web world, we call this the TechCrunch bump, you know, right? You get your, your product out on TechCrunch and you get tens of thousands of visitors. And then as the months go, not only do you, does the number of visitors dip, but the number of people that you originally got aren't, are no longer using your web service. So your retention is really low. So uh, what Lean Startups tries to do is, let, you know, let's flip that. Instead of before you're doing your big launch, before you spend two or three years in all of this money building product that you don't know, uh, whether people want, but you integrate that approach. You integrate the market and the customer development with your product development. 
So uh, Patrick and I like to say, you know, th this is not, if you can just get these philosophical principles in terms of lean startups and customer development, you're good to go. We're not advocating a step-by-step -step approach or a very rigid methodology. So basically, our, the philosophy here is question your own assumptions, right? So everything that you think you know about your startup are actually guesses. So you know you, you want to you want to say what you what you think you know uh, as forcefully as you can because you believe in yourself and all the rest. I and I agree with that. Believe in your yourself, but be skeptical of your ideas. And then this is a big idea. This is Steve Blank again, the the, the author of the Four Steps of Epiphany. It's called Get Out of the Building. Right. What he means to say is, I have a great idea for I want to sell um, cupcakes. Right. And I'm going to have these cool cupcakes. They're going to be jalapeno pumpkin flavored cupcakes. They're going to be amazing. Right. Instead of me building the factory to build my jalapeno pumpkin cupcakes, why don't I go out and try to sell a few brands? You've been watching like the Cupcake Wars, haven't you? Yeah, no, <laughs> it's actually, I hate cupcakes, that's why I keep using this. And so the point is this, why not try to do some validation, right, before I actually do scale? Again, it sounds deceptively simple. If, if it were that simple, or if, if we had understood this 10 years ago, billions of dollars would have been wasted, right? So you guys maybe remember Webvan from, from the dot-com boom, right? They scaled to build home delivery, you know, online ordering, ordering for groceries, and they, you know, they actually didn't validate that either because they don't want to, at that time, want to order groceries online, right? So get out of the building and actually validate these ideas. And the, the last sort of step is iterate on these ideas, right? So don't, don't do it just once, right? I go to Brent, I try to sell him some cupcakes. He goes, you know what, I don't like orange flavored ones. I like uh, cherry flavored ones, and I'll pay twice as much for those because I can sell them to my you know, I firmly yeah. believe that fruit and dessert should not be mixed. So yeah. I'm just still the, the, the point is that you want to iterate through these, you want to iterate and cycle through these things, right? And this actually, this this get out of the building again. This is Steve Blank's shorthand phrase for you know get out to your 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 client's site and, and figure out their reality. You know, there's other other sort of acronyms that say the same things. Uh, nothing interesting happens in the office. I've heard that before. People have thrown that around. Uh, and then in the lean manufacturing philosophy, there's actually a Japanese expression that means essentially the same thing. Uh, you know, get out and see what's happening in the, in the real world. So what does this mean in terms of uh, market assessments? Um, so traditionally, uh, there's talked about a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach. So we'll talk about this real quickly. To me, uh, the first thing that you want to ask yourself is what is your what is the objective that you're trying to do with your market assessment? Um, is it because you're putting together one of these 40-page business plans and you need to come up with your hockey stick? Uh, are you trying to raise money so you need to convince an investor that, about how much money you're going to make? Um, I, would, I would say that the, the, the first reason why you should be doing a market assessment is is to figure out whether you actually want to build your startup. And you should think about it in terms of if, if in the end nobody wants my product, how bummed am I going to be that I spent six months a year building the company, right? So the cupcakes top-down approach. Right. So this is pretty typical. Uh, if you guys have ever seen a, uh, a you know a, a pitch deck, right? Big massive number: nine billion dollars for cupcakes, or for online food ordering, or for online dog food ordering, whatever it is, right? It's pretty typical. I, I mean, again, I'm sort of, uh, car what's the word I'm looking for? Absolutely not. Anyway, uh, pretty typical. Usually, you know, Gartner or Forrester or one of these big research firms, right? You can you quote them. You see it all the time. You can buy reports, right, where the Gartner guys went out, did a bunch of research, then you can quote them. It feels pretty good. Uh, I tend to be pretty skeptical about those. I think they give you a good sort of ballpark figure if it's a massive market or small, but, you know, how do those guys arrive to that? Um, those conclusions right. may not be may not be suitable for your startup. So, you know, these numbers can be useful when you're demonstrating you have a big vision and it's a big vision inside of a, a of a big market, right? So, uh, if you're trying to raise money, investors will want to see you know what is sort of the dollar figure that represents you know the the, the, the great wide world that you're actually trying to tackle. Um, but it's also it's also a dangerous number, right? So it can be very self-delusional. You know the the uh, the number of decks that I've seen where they've had you know sort of a massive number up there. You know, I'm not sure it's quite as much as a bazillion, but you know, and then they'll say, 
Well, you know, conservatively, we estimate that we're going to tackle one percent of that market, right? So one percent is a conservative number, you know. But one percent of a bazillion, you know, that's actually still a pretty big number. So uh, it's pretty easy to get into a game of self-delusion there, and you actually haven't you actually haven't demonstrated that anything about uh, being able to tackle that market. So while I'm going to say I'm not going to say ne you know never do this, um, I am going to say that you need to use that number. Uh, wisely, and uh, you know, I don't think that there's an investor out there that hasn't seen, you know, deck after deck that you know has uh, been told about their you know several billion dollar market. Uh, so be wary of of the the top down approach. So then there's the uh, the bottoms up approach. Yeah. So this is bottoms up. So this is uh, clearly, uh, you know, how you back into another equally large number, hopefully, right? So here. I chose red velvet coconut jalapeno cupcakes. They're forty dollars a pop. In my little market, I think I can address in one year. There's a million people are going to buy, and I think they're going to buy fourteen times a year, right? X, Y times Z, right? We get massive market, right? That's it's really pretty simple. You can you can again. This is a very simple example. You can do this much more sophisticated, depending on what you're selling, what your product is. I intentionally chose. Cupcakes to keep it simple. I don't want to. I don't want to. You know, if you're running a freemium business and you're going to be, you know, um, uh, disrupting, uh, you know, Salesforce.com, you know, CRM stuff. It's going to be a different sort of model, but it, essentially the model is the same. Um, I took this from Dave McClure's Startup Viagra, How to Pitch a VC, by the way. So if uh, if you are interested in, you know, building a uh, pitch deck for a VC, go see Dave's stuff. Right. So there's a little. If you, you can either Google start a Viagra how to pitch VC or just take that short URL right there. Uh, not you know, not very sophisticated. You know, it's not very complicated. I don't think there's you know we can all do simple multiplication here and, and division. So the um, the advantage to an approach like this is uh, is that it actually exposes all of your assumptions, right? So it, it your your assumption on how much money you're going to make you know per cupcake or per dozen. About forty-two dollars for one. Yeah. Wow. That's Newport Beach prices. <laughs> yeah. So an assumption would be it's the the price. There's actually uh, maybe even a line in between here, which is, you know, what is your reach? You know, based on your marketing, how many eyeballs are going to even get on your offer? And then there's a conversion number there, right? How many people are actually going to to buy out of those numbers? Um, so you, you end up exposing a bunch of assumptions and the reason why investors like that is because they're going to take all of your assumptions and they're going to you know, slash them by you know, 50 to 90 percent and try to figure out if there's actually any valid business in there, right? It's sort of like they're going to look at it best case scenario by maybe using your numbers and then worst case scenario by slashing them by 90 percent and uh, trying to figure out you know, how, how bad off you are at that point. Um, so I, we definitely uh, 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 support the bottom-up approach, and um, not only because it, it exposes the assumptions, but it actually gives you it gives you uh, an idea of what you need to be working on, right? So um, you can actually start segmenting your market if you're thinking about it from a bottoms-up approach. And, and basically, uh, keep in mind that if you're going to get an investment or you're going to build a business, you're going to have to do this sort of financial modeling anyway. You're going to have to understand who are your uh, customers, who are going to be your early adopters, the people that are the first ones that uh, uh, want to try out you know, radical uh, jalapeno-based cupcakes, um, and, and how you know, you're going to be able to estimate what's the cost to reach them. You know, maybe there's a, a, a specific blogs for jalapeno lovers, you know, and so you can start estimating how much money it's going to cost for you to reach those people. So it really is a, it's a financially based, bottoms up approach to figuring out what's the reasonable amount of money it's going to spend to get to those people. So then what you really want to get to is to the point that you, you've got a, here's what your cost of acquisition is, and here once they become addicted to these, pupcake, to these cupcakes, this is my lifetime value, they're going to continue to buy, and now you, you have the, the, the basics of your business model, your proposed, your guest business model. Um, and that's what the, the investor wants to see. But like I said before, it gives you things to test, right? You can start testing those market segments. So we're saying do customer development to validate the segments and your other assumptions. 
And the customer development is you actually go out and you talk to these people, right? You can do surveys, you can do uh, landing pages online where you're measuring uh, uh, clicks through on, on AdWords, and this is all just for testing, right? And uh, there's a bunch of online tools that you can use, askyourtargetmarket.com, a uh, bunch of ways available online now for you to start interacting with your customers. But all of those, in my mind, need to be uh, uh, corroborated with individual uh, interviews, with speaking to people to see whether there's anybody passionate about this, this solution that you're, you're uh, bringing into the market. And it also helps you divide those segments, right? What is the profile or the demographic of this person? What does their social market look like? What, who do they talk to? Who influences them? Um, that's what you kind of want to learn about your, your different segments. So your numbers are just guesses until you validate your business model. Your, your uh, market assessment is more accurate with the more that you validate. And guess what? Most investments these days do not come before proof. So if you've got a bunch of, if you've got several startups underneath your belt, you've um, you know, uh, had a, a couple of exits, then uh, you'll probably be able to get some money uh, based on a, a, on a good idea. If you've got the pitch together and, and the, you know, the investors do believe it's a good idea. But if you're a first time entrepreneur, it, you're just not going to get money based on an idea anymore. You have to start building your product. You have to start proving your market. You have to start proving part of your business model. Any questions, by the way? We've got to go in fast. So, the question is this. You know, if you go back to the root or roots, entrepreneurs are like, a, some of them I know are like software engineers or and they create this greatest mousetrap. But at least they know in the market side. They, they always complain they don't know how to sell. They don't know how to size the market. And then you throw in and say, hey, you know what? You got to do this bottom up thing. And it has to be a rigorous model so you can check their assumptions, et cetera. So that's where the disconnect is. Well, it's, it's one of the reasons why we, we love that uh, lean machine weekend that we were talking about, because we get teams of engineers that were hoping they were going to stay inside the building hacking on products all day, and we make them get out and go talk to customers. So it really is, it's one of those things that, you know, if there's, uh, engineers will spend a lot of time trying to figure out and actually invent tools so that they don't actually ever have to talk to a customer, right? So all of those tools that I was telling you about, usabilitytesting.com, right? Oh yeah, you know, you just go to there and they're actually going to take care of all that customer stuff for me and I'll be good to go, right? So it is, it's a hurdle to overcome. Uh, the fact is, is that engineers can now do a lot of really good marketing without ever talking to a customer. They can, so it doesn't have to be this, you know, uh, fluffy Madison Avenue marketing that uh, engineers aren't drawn to. It actually can be uh, process oriented. It's it's similar to similar to using a scientific process, so that actually appeals to a lot of these engineers. Um, and uh, you know, if you give up that side of the business, if you give up the sales and marketing side, and you go and hire. Uh, you know, it's sort of an old school traditional sales and marketing, you're going to be spending a lot of money without seeing results. So maybe, maybe some of those engineers have to suffer that pain before they go, well, next time I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it a little bit differently. This is embracing the reality that we've all heard, we've all heard, you know, the phrase like, uh, uh, build a better mousetrap and the world will be a path to your door, right? This is embracing the reality that that's actually bullshit, right? For the most part. Right, and, and engineers are, are we all we like solving problems. Often, people solve problems that solve problems, provide solutions for problems that don't exist. This is what we're getting at. So let me give you another example. So Segway, you guys remember Segway when that yeah. first was going to come out, right? It was going to change the shape of cities and you know urban landscapes. No one ever bothered to check if people wanted to spend you know three grand for this kind of dorky looking scooter thing, right? And 5,000 5, at the time, right, right? No one ever checked. Now they've pivoted actually into like the security, you know, the mall cop sort of and touristy business. But, you know, but my understanding at the time was aimed at Square, at the everyday consumer, and it was gonna, you know, replace the car. That was, right, that was the hype around it. That was the PR and hype around it. That's how they were positioning it. Guess what, people don't wanna, you know, drop 5K for that. I, you know, maybe there's a few people that do, the point is that the technology was awesome, right? Remember at the time, it was like amazing. You stepped on it, bounced perfectly, like mind-blowing technology. 
It doesn't matter. This is what I'm getting at. You gotta, you gotta go out, get out of the building and like test these assumptions. You can have the best mousetrap ever if it's not really solving so the problems. So the message is the engineer, the entrepreneur, has to just get out and do it. Because I, I agree with Brent, right? Yes. That the hiring of the old school, you know, sales guy and paying 200,000 and bonuses, etc., cetera, uh, ha have not worked, at least the guys I work with. Or you hire them once you figured out, right. once you validated all of the stuff, right? So once you go, okay, I know exactly what I'm selling, I know how to reach my customers, I know how much cost to acquire them, I know the messaging they, they respond to, I know their substitutes, then you go hire that silver tongued, you know, six five, you know, sales guy who's you know great on the golf course and he just goes and executes. That's when you hire that guy. And there are and there are are actually like in the B2B world you can you can hire what what we call the, the Renaissance sales guy and that's a sales guy that actually does understand how to go out and learn the market. Um, so you know, it's not like to throw all sales and marketing people under the bus. I've been a marketing person, you know, for a long time, and, and it, I guess it's the differentiation between number one, old school versus new school. You don't want the old school just grabs, you know, from a their toolkit and goes and executes on the X, Y, and Z that they've always done before, and and that's sort of a dangerous way to go if nobody has actually figured out what the right methods are, and you can spend a lot of money and burn through all your resources by doing that. So there are salespeople, there are marketing people that you can hire that will help you to figure out what that roadmap should be, what the sales and marketing roadmap should be, and then you turn that over to your turnkey marketers and your turnkey salespeople. Now, it doesn't it doesn't get away from the need though from the for the founders who hold the core assumptions of their business that they're the ones that need to go and talk to the customers to validate what those core assumptions are. Is there really a problem they're, that they're trying to solve? Is there the solution that you have in your mind uh, going to solve that problem? Or is it going to likely solve that problem? Or does it sound appealing to the customer who supposedly has that problem? There's really no way around understanding, honing in on the market signal, right? Understanding that pain. So in one of these uh, Lean Machine events that we did in San Francisco a couple weeks ago, a team was building uh, uh, like a photo sharing service, right? And we're all like, oh, another photo sharing. I mean, we need another photo sharing service. And what was what they wanted to do was actually they were going to use some, I guess, face recognition technology or look at past photos that these people had, had shared and figure out what are the good photos, right? So what are the good, the high quality photos of a family? And they thought, or whatever pictures that you're taking, and they thought that the pros might like this market because they're taking you know, thousands and thousands of, of pictures. So could you actually develop a technology that will pick the good pictures out of, that, out of that lot? The pros hated the idea. They actually loved the process of going through and selecting those photographs. What they found, though, were moms were eager for that. They actually, they felt like Socially, they felt like bad moms if they could not produce quality pictures of their kids. And so the, 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 one of the guys that was presenting this idea at the, at the end when we were doing the, the finals was saying, saying when, when he felt the emotion from this woman talking about how involved they needed to be in, in choosing the pictures and that, if they, that she could have help with that and that she could have these you know, great photographs that it was really important to her and she was emotional to this guy when when they were talking and it was and that was the point where this customer development he had he had you know sort of dove in deep enough to understand the emotional connection that's the pain that you're trying to uncover right in the b2b world it's usually money driven you know can you increase my roi can you you know expand my market segments a lot of these things are are very measurable but in the b2c world it's often a it's often an emotional thing that, you, that you're trying to connect with. And that's what you're trying to do with customer development, is trying to dig in deep enough to understand that that, that need or that pain or that passion um, actually exists. And also, real quick, uh, riffing on what Brian just said about, I want to go take a step back about sales and marketing, right? The, there's a time in this customer development model, which the Kool-Aid that Brent and I obviously drink from, there's time for learning, where the founders are, are learning, and there's time for executing. And so I actually have a friend up in LA, he's, got a, he's at a pretty prominent, well-funded startup, and I spoke to him a few weeks ago, 
And I said, oh, how are sales going? He goes, oh, our sales guy is awesome. We just closed like 10 deals, high fives all around, you know, rock and roll, you know, cash is coming in. A week later, I talked to him, like, oh, how's that going? He goes, you know, I just, I just figured something out. We're still at this learning phase. Those 10 deals we closed, they're all different customers, meaning different types of customers. They're all for different amounts, and we're all doing something slightly different. We actually don't have anything scalable or repeatable. And the sales guy was doing what the sales guy's paid to do, go execute. Close these guys, and the guy's a great salesperson, right? So the sales guy, my friend, and uh, the CEO had to have a meeting and say, hey, sales guy, we gotta put you on a leash because we don't know what you're selling, right? I mean, this guy's just closing deals, but what they're actually searching for is a repeatable, scalable model. You see what I'm saying? And so this, this is not against sales or marketing. This is, there's a time for execution, there's a time for learning. And so it's you know, context dependent. And I think that's a nuance a lot of people miss about customer development. And so, that happens all the time. Absolutely. Okay. So those guys go there from CEO, CEO says, can you do this? Sure, you can do it. <laughs> right. And now it's a big headache for the software guys to sort of change whatever that industry wants to run. So how do you find that sweet spot <clears throat> between you know the soft launch, the beta site testing, gathering feedback, fine tuning it, to locking, locking it down, doing the formal launch, scaling up? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and it's like one of the most difficult ones to answer, right? So, I was afraid you'd say. Yeah, go ahead. You have so, so I was gonna say, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you an irritatingly philosophical answer about this, which I know you're looking for actionable stuff, and like I wish I had like the exact, you know, I could get right in your brain and know exactly, you know what the answer is, assuming <coughs> I know it, which I don't. Uh, there's this concept called product market fit. I don't know if everyone's heard of this uh, concept. It's when you, you found, you know, the, 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 the solution that nails, you know, the, the, the problem, you know the price that people are responding to. You know the messaging. You know how much it costs to acquire a customer. Theoretically, the long, you know, the the, the long-term value of that is higher. That's when you go, okay, now let's go get some money. And now we actually have a we built a machine where you put in a dollar and it spits out three. That's when you scale theoretically. Again, this is sort of philosophical sort of understanding of this. And this is kind of you know what what people talk about. This is actually popularized by uh, Mark Andreessen. I don't know if you get pretty pop, pretty famous entrepreneur in the Silicon Valley. He, he actually wrote a blog post about this a few years ago and sort of explored these ideas. So it's nebulous, right? You, the way I sort of describe it is you, you know you're there when you wake up and you have a whole new set of problems. So before you're there, your problems are, you know, where are my leads coming from? You know, how can I optimize my conversion funnel? Um, we're not reaching it, we're not acquiring enough people to our website, you know, how do I build that? How do I convert them? Now they're, now they're in our system, they're not retaining my sales. You know, it's, I, I sold 10, but to 10 different people. And then, and then when, when you've reached it, suddenly your set of problems are, you know, I can't, I can't fix bugs fast enough, my customer, I don't have enough customer support, my servers are crashing, um, so it really is, it's, it's when they, your, your customer is now leading you instead of yeah. you're leading your customer. When the demand overwhelms the uh, capacity. Yeah. And there's different sort of, also different sort of analogs as well. So is that what you, you call product market fit or product market misfit? No, that's product, product market fit. If, there's, if, the, if, it's, uh, if it's a misfit, then uh, uh, you don't even have anybody well, knocking on the door. Right? <laughs> so let me give you, yeah, these are great problems. These are problems that you can all solve with money. Right, this is the problem you would be seeing. Right, kind of problems. Right, this is where you go, hey, I need, I need more you know, server capacity. It's gonna cost me $10 million a year. The reason why is because money's flowing into my pocket. Can I get you know, good terms? These are great problems to have. Right. I mean, like it, money solves your problems. You're, you're on a shared server before, on an after, you're on a dedicated server, right? And you have this, this, gotcha. this painful point where you know, your stuff is crashing and all the rest, and you, got, you're, you have to go off and do other things. Uh, but alternatively, to follow on his comment, not to pivot too soon in the valley of death. Sure, but it's true. That's again, it's you know, it's one of the things that we actually talk about. That uh, I'll, I'll, we'll just hop around to some of these slides. Is that the, you know, there's nothing deterministic about lean startups in this methodology, right? It's not a paint by numbers approach, and so this doesn't take away anything from the art of entrepreneurship. And the question of when you when do you keep busting down that door uh, because you, you really think that there's something there or uh, no it's time to pivot I mean that's a, that's a that's a founder's decision right there's no methodology for for making that decision and you asked about pivot earlier so the concept of pivot really is you're 
your business model, you have several aspects of your business model, you know, you're trying it out, something doesn't work, but you have learned some things. So you keep one foot planted down in what you've learned, and then you're pivoting the other aspects of your business model, and maybe you pivot m multiple times, and the second pivot is you're leaving the first, where you first had your foot down. So, uh, and that's different in my mind than iterating. Iterating is when you're actually testing a, a particular uh, idea. It could be messaging, positioning, landing pages, you know, product features. So, uh, uh, and those are just are, are sort of smaller changes that you're making to try to figure out what's the right thing and what works versus you know a business model change is really where the pivot comes in. Really quickly, also anecdotal story about product market fit. You also see sort of the negative. So when Twitter goes down. Right, when Twitter goes down, people go nuts, right? Like people complain about the blogs, the blog sphere blows up, right? Twitter goes down, it's a big deal. A friend of mine, he's got a startup, his, his site went down, he didn't know about it for eight hours. Not one of his customers, no one complained about it, right? Pretty clear, he's nowhere near product market fit, right? And he, we joked about this, he's like, yeah, like there's no pain, right? Uh, another friend of mine, a uh, different guy, their site went down for like five minutes. They had the CEOs of five of their customers call up their CEO within seconds. Right, so it kind of gives you some ways to triangulate around sort of this nebulous concept. In, in terms of uh, actual methodology and process, uh, I have several clients that are sort of mired in that area. It's really where most startups probably die is searching for that product market fit, and, and actually, you know, maybe it doesn't ever happen. Right, it, that's when you pivot. Um, but in terms of process, it's very customer driven. So it's not that you're doing what the customer says, which is actually this slide. So customer development is not feature mongering. It's not, it's not asking what the customer wants and then going and building that, which is another trap that entrepreneurs fall, in, fall into. You want to use you know, what's called the five whys, right? which I think is an agile approach to solving engineering problems inside your company. When, when a customer says that they want something, you, you need to ask them why. And you need to keep asking why until you understand why it is that they're asking for it. What is the pain that they're actually solving? They don't necessarily know what's the best way to solve it. They're gonna give you a bunch of ideas, but not until you understand what they're trying to solve can you maybe come up with the right solution. And so what you're doing during this phase where you're trying to reach product market fit is you're hopefully iterating quickly on your product. You're, you're constantly talking to customers to try to hone in on what it is that they're trying to solve and what it is that they need. And you're measuring their passion for the product, right? So there's a couple of methods of measuring passion. Um, Sean Ellis uh, sort of invented the, the survey.io where it asks the question, you know, if this product went away, how disappointed would you be? And, and you know, people throw out their numbers like 40%, 50%. If you can get that number of people that would say they would be very disappointed if your product was no longer available, then that's an indication of passion. And you're trying to grow that user passion, trying to grow the fervor of that passion and you're trying to grow the number of, of people that actually have that passion. And that's really what drives you, I think, towards product market fit. If you're increasing the passion, the number of people that are passionate, it's a good market signal that you're on to something. And, and so you're, you're constantly uh, in conversations with your customers. And, and really, you know, in, the, in, in this world of, of software, internet, uh, and iPhone apps and all the rest, your IP, there is no IP anymore, right? It's so easy to copy this stuff. Um, you're not gonna be able to get patents and, and protect your, your internet idea most likely. Even if you've got the patents, the, the, your ability to litigate is, is you know, very small. Your differentiation and your winning, your winning combination is your relationship with your customers. So if you're developing passion with your customers, that's what's gonna keep them your customers, right? Your interaction with them and the passion that you create is your differentiator. Um, and so establishing those re relationships early on is, is what's going to hopefully you know, tend you towards this product market fit. Why don't we go to the slide with the, the folks so that they can follow and check out. So the... Uh, Steve Blank, he wrote the book called The Four Steps of the Epiphany. Uh, that's his Twitter handle right there as well. Um, if you're at all interested in what we've been talking about, he's sort of the progenitor of all this stuff. I recommend reading his book, uh, The Four Steps of the Epiphany, again, immediately. Uh, it's had a dramatic effect on the way I view 
startups and startup life. Uh, one of his students is a guy named Eric Ries. He uh, took Eric, uh, Steve's idea of customer development and melded it with agile software development, and this is what he calls Lean Startup. Uh, he's got a great blog called Startup Lessons Learned. Uh, Sean Ellis is a, is a guy that Brant mentioned, uh, probably the, the premier sort of startup marketer. Uh, he's actually in a, doing his own startup right now, but his, his blog is, is pure gold for startup marketing. Uh, Heaton Shaw is an entrepreneur up in the Silicon Valley, uh, very data-driven guy, also part of the sort of the lead startup uh, crew, as it were. Uh, he run, his company is called Kissmetrics. Um, and then Rich Collins runs a Google group, Lean Startup Circle Google group. Uh, if you just Google that, you'll find that if you're interested to get the sort of things that the brand and I are talking about. We'll make this deck available too, so uh, yeah. so you'll be able to get access to these. Dave, uh, Dave McClure should probably be up oh, yeah. there yeah. as well. 500 hats. 500 hats, 500 startups. Dave McClure should be on there as well. Um, and he, he's he's got some uh, great his pirate slide on uh, his pirate metrics. Uh, if you're doing online, but the marketing <coughs> is really important. He also writes about uh, changes in the investment world that are, I think are right on. And I guess last thing, so to pitch Brent myself, so we wrote a book called Entrepreneurs Got to Customer Development. It's uh, a cheat sheet to Steve's book. Uh, Steve's book's amazing, you should go out and buy it, but it's very thick, very dense, and uh, it really makes you earn the knowledge in it. We, we did sort of a, a Cliff Notes version of it. Uh, you can get it as a PDF at custdev.com. You can get his paperback on Amazon or Kindle. Um, and if you use the, the discount code there, you can get 20% off if you buy it as a PDF. And, and so, then our contact info here, we like to discuss the book or uh, anything else uh, that you'd like to discuss. So, uh, yeah. so thank you for having us. And if you guys have any questions, questions. about anything we talked about, throw them at us. I yeah. have a question. Uh, you mainly mentioned that customer uh, is the major person you should consider when you are developing products. But customer is only part of the stakeholder. Right. I mean, vendor is the stakeholder. Uh, the innovator is the stakeholder. I'll give you an example. You know, when 3M invented uh, the post-it note, if they would have asked anyone, you know, do you need a post-it note, sticky note? No one would have a clue, you know, I right. don't need it. Right. Text machine, I didn't need it, but right. I can't live without it, you see? Right. Same thing with the post-it note. So I think we should also Look at other stakeholders, you know, Absolutely. right, and not only the end user as the stakeholder. No, right. It's a good point. So it, it all depends on it all depends on your business, your business model. We actually have a section in the book where where uh, we do what I call the the customer development whiteboard, and it's it's as if you were you know in a room with your management team or with your other people, and you draw your ecosystem. What is your ecosystem? How do we envision this product getting to market? Right. Um, what is the value prop for each one of those stakeholders? Which ones are mission critical, right? And so which ones should you focus on first? And what are your assumptions around there? And, and, and it lines up the things that you should do customer development to test. So yeah, it all depends. We, we, tend, to talk, we tend to talk you know, a little bit generically about um, you know, customer and product, but there's all sorts of you know, other alternative business models out there that make those ecosystems uh, very complex. So you bring one up. There's end tier, you know, marketplaces where you've got, you know, it only works when when all the entities are, are at the website. There's, you know, network effect businesses. So yeah, there, it, I think that there's a way to use these methodologies for any of those business models, um, but you, you have to be creative and you have to figure out who it is that you need to, to talk to in order to validate part of your business model. So what are the riskiest elements of your business model? Back to your 3M posted example, that's a great example, I'm glad you brought it up. So what Brent and I are saying aren't that, hey, do you want, you know, tell me what you want right. and then it'll come out fully formed from the customer's mouth. And they're like, oh, I want a little square thing, I want it to be kind of bright uh, yellow and I want a sticky side and I want to be able to tear them off and put them everywhere, right? Often that's not, like people don't think that way, right? But as an entrepreneur, you have the vision, right? I'm guessing though, like the 3M story, I know there's been like, it's not in the news how they came about. I'm guessing though, what they probably did is they observed but the guy who came, you know, you probably observed how people were taking notes, right? So no one actually verbalized to him, this is what I want, and I want it to be this cool, and I'm going to throw it up on my whiteboard, right? But he probably observed, you know, or uh, Staples, for example. They say that Staples, the guys actually went out and looked at how much, how much uh, uh, office supplies people were purchasing at companies. And they, they asked, like, for example, like an admin or a secretary, say, oh, how much do you spend on supplies? And they go, oh, I don't know, 100 bucks a month. And then they actually went out and went into the storeroom and actually started like looking at it and like, wait a second, this is actually $2,000 worth of supplies. 
right? And they saw this mismatch on in terms of what customers are saying, potential customers are saying, and customers are actually doing, right? Massive difference often. And so you can still apply the same principles to that. But again, I don't. I just wanted to be clear. No, no one who understands customer development thinks that they're gonna, you know, the customers gonna spit on exactly what they want to you. They can talk about their problems and their pains and their passions, and as the entrepreneur is sort of beholden to suss that out and create a solution. Yeah. 